Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 6. You know, when you preach verse by verse and chapter by chapter, you don't choose your topic. And, you know, if you, there are those who, who would rather skip certain texts that, you know, a little difficult, perhaps a little strange that you may not want to go over and just kind of glance over it and go on to the next topic. But when you preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you don't get a opportunity for that. Today our text is going to be about Jesus' teaching about enemies. The Old Testament was a different dispensation than the New Testament, and it taught a limited form of vengeance. For example, in Exodus 21, 23, the Bible says, but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for life. The term eye for eye and tooth for tooth is in this same passage. The Bible taught that if someone took your tooth, you took their tooth. Now, I don't know if there's a lot of toothless people in that day, but who knows? But we see here, folks, that the Old Testament had a message of vengeance. But Jesus in our text today is going to teach a new law for an old problem. And that old problem is sin. What do you do with sin? You know, if everyone was nice and everybody was kind and everybody was thoughtful and everybody was merciful and graceful, you know, you wouldn't have to have laws to do this. But we see that in a world in which we live today, beloved, we need laws. We need laws to govern ourselves. Now, by no means should it ever be suspected that I am a pacifist, because I am not. Uh, many years ago, when I graduated from high school, I joined an organization that was not a pacifist organization. <laughs> it's the least thing you can say about the United States Marine Corps. It is not a pacifist organization. I believe that there are those Christians in our world today that are pacifists and they have the right as a citizen of our country to be so. I don't agree with their reasoning, I don't agree with their thinking, but I do believe that, that they have the right to do so. There are acts of sin, beloved, and there are acts as a Christian of sanctification. Obviously, as a Christian, I think we ought to do things that would bring honor and glory to him, and I do think we ought to do things that would bring great uh, strength to us as a Christian. You see, our head begins to think about these matters and, and our belief system guides our thinking and how we have our world vision is how we're going to make decisions in life. The things we are taught by our parents, the things we are taught by our society, the things we are taught by our Bible are going to influence the decisions that we make. So our belief system definitely affects our behavior. Secondly, our heart, so to speak, gives us decisions based on our belief system. And so we need to make those decisions according to what we believe the Bible teaches as Christians or that Jesus teaches. And then our hand is the aspect of the actions of our belief system, our decision-making decisions, and there we implement them in action. Now we have to understand that the Old Testament and the New Testament are different dispensations. One is that of law, the other is that of grace. We see God in the Old Testament as a God of vengeance. In the New Testament, we see him as a God of grace. But again, we see later on in the book of Revelation and Revelation 19 that when Jesus comes back, he comes back as a conquering king and we come back with him. Now, beloved, I don't know about what's going to happen to the pacifists in that day, but I do know that we're going to come back to rule and reign with Christ, and we're going to come to, to overcome this world in all ways and manner. We must look at this topic in a practical Christian way. Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, verse 8 says, A time to love, a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. The great Solomon wrote there in Ecclesiastes, there is a time under God that all these things should happen. We have to have that decision. 
we must make those decisions with our belief system, with our heart, and we must apply them to our hands. And so we see we must become practical in this matter. We live in a world of suffering. We live in a world of sin. We live in a world of evil. There are evil people in this world. There are people who would do everything they could to destroy we Christians. Why, who has heard 20 years ago, you would not have heard of all the people that walk into churches and, and try to kill people in churches. You would never have heard of that. But today we must be diligent. We must be protective in these matters. So let's start with verse 27 of Luke 6. And we're going to see two things today. We're going to see principles of his teaching and we're going to see the practice of his teaching. In verse 27, the Bible says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is it to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Now, this is not a teaching that the early Christians or that the early Jewish people of that time really wanted to hear. They were under subjection of a foreign government, the government of the empire of Rome. They were very hard-nosed about the fact that they were in control. They would come and take your cloak if they were cold. They would come and ask you, not ask you, but tell you that you had to carry their pack for a mile. There are many laws that were written in that time that the Jewish people who did not want to be under the subjection of slavery to be underneath those laws. But we see Jesus here is teaching something a little different. We're not talking about the issues of life and death. We're talking about the issues of living. Now what we must understand that probably, well not probably, the most sacred thing given to us in this world is life. Now folks, I, I don't understand the problem we have today in our societies worldwide globally of understanding this. 65 million children were aborted since Roe versus Wade. And we know there's more than that since that particular study. 65 million. That's almost 10 times the population of Israel. 10 times. We're talking about nations. Nations of people. And yet, where is life to these people? What is life? We have an evil evil system in this world that has from its foundations the hatred, the blind hatred of Satan. And we must be careful, beloved. We must pray. We must be involved in prayer in these matters. In verse 27, we see a matter for the heart, a matter of decision making. In verse 27, the Bible says, but I say to you who hear, if you're going to listen, if you can hear this, Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. We see the principle of God's love. Jesus spoke to the, to the Jews in, in Matthew, the 12th chapter, said, brood of vipers. He didn't go to the school of how to make friends and influence enemies. Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. 
And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Jesus said there is a difference between evil and good. And we as Christians ought to seek, those who follow Jesus ought to seek that which is good. And what is that which is good? So that we might introduce Jesus to others. That people might see the love of Christ in our lives. That we might imitate Jesus to others. The Bible says from the goodness treasure of the heart, the goodness of our heart, the treasure that is there that we have abundantly in our speaking and our actions. We see we have the principle of God's love. And then there's the purpose of God's love. In verse 27, the Bible says, do good to those who hate you. The purpose of that is that we might introduce Christ to others, that we might witness of Christ to other people. There are people at work you know that you work with tomorrow that are not good people. <laughs> They're going to be ugly. They're going to do everything they can to try to get your position or to get your, your uh, pay or whatever they can do. They, they don't care who you are or what you are. They'll do anything they can to, to go over you. Now, beloved, how do you deal with that every day? Let me say the Bible teaches us that we ought to love and not hate them. The Bible says, do good to those who hate you. Now, that's difficult. Let me say to you, I know that that is difficult. I've worked in the real world. I know. Now, I don't have a secretary that gives me a hard time when I come here tomorrow. She's real nice and talks to me really nice, doesn't cuss me out or anything like that, you know. She's a real good, she's a real good secretary. I have a working environment that is the best in all the world, but I have worked in the real world. I know what it's like. I've been there too. And I understand that it's a difficult thing because you're fearful for your job. And so what we see, the Bible tells us that we ought to witness of Christ in everything we say and do. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Everything we say and do ought to be that of life. That is the underlying. Jesus said, I've come to bring life and to bring it abundantly. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, but I've come to give life and give it abundantly. Everything we say and do must be in that principle of life. And then to win those for Christ. To win those for Christ. You know, they, they notice you. The people who might say things about you, the people who might do things against you, they notice you. and They notice there's something different about you. One day they may come to you and give you that opportunity to win them to Christ. James 5.20 says, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Jesus says to love those who hate you. And then verse 28, we see a matter for the head, not just for the principles of, of our, our uh, action, but for the head, the thinking. We see in verse 28, the principle of blessing. The Bible says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. We see the principle of blessing in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. It says, but I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. And so we see the actions that we take in our mind, the thought patterns, is that we should be one of blessing, to share God's protective blessing with others. You might be the only Christian there at work, and you know what? Your blessings are going to protect that, that place. Your blessings are going to protect those people. Proverbs 11.11 11 says, By the blessings of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Oh, folks, you ask yourself this question. Why do certain bad things happen to certain cities and not to others? It's because the light of those who of God are blessing that city. Your presence is a blessing to them. Our presence is an opportunity to bring God's blessing upon our city. 
Oh, you give a city that's full of sin, you give a city that's full of sinful people, you're going to see crime going out the door, aren't you? That's why it's important, I think, to, to elect the right people. That's why I think as Christians, we need to vote. I think we have a responsibility to elect people that we know that will protect our cities, protect our state, protect our country. We see we ought to have this protective blessing and our presence will do that. That's why America has been blessed, folks. America has been blessed because of the Christian nation that it has been and that it still is for time being. Oh, folks, I've never seen so much animosity towards the Christian faith today. Those poor people in Alabama just trying to bring a law to do what they would desire to do. And the whole country, it seems, has turned against them. You know, the whole thing is, why, why, why is it wrong to do right? Why is it wrong to, to love life? But we see that their sin is basically very prevalent in their mind. That's why as Christians, our love, our grace, our mercy is a thing to protect not only our families, but protect our country and our state and our city. And then we're to share God's provision of grace in verse 28. The Bible says, pray for those who spitefully use you. James 3.10 says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. He said, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. We ought to be people of blessing, folks. I know you get angry, you get upset. Folks, you know, you just drive around the city for a while. That'll take your joy out of your life, won't it? I tell you, you know, it, it's unbelievable what this world... I've seen people who are just angry. They will shoot you for the silliest things. This road rage things, folks, you know, I never... Rem I don't remember this when I was a kid, when I was first driving. I never heard of road rage. Had you? Don't look at me like you haven't been driving longer than I have. <laughs> but you know, things have gone crazy. People are angry, are they not? We must be careful. We must provide the provision of grace. And then in this practice of blessing, we need to pray for their situation. There are times, folks, I'll pray for people that I don't know. I'll see them and I'll, I'll see that they're either very angry or they're very upset or something's wrong. And the Lord will say, pray for that individual and I'll pray for them. We need to pray for their situation. We don't know what they're going through. We don't know what troubles they're enduring. We don't know what sadness is in their home or at work. We need to pray for them. And then we need to pray for their salvation, that God would bring someone into their life that would bring the love of Christ to them. Oh, folks, I, I have seen people that I have talked to that I have never seen again, but just spoke a word of blessing to them. That perhaps someone later on took that seed that I planted in that life or that water that I put on the seed that had been planted way before me and reaped the benefit for Christ. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. In verse 29 through 31, we see a matter for the hand, that action that we do, which is based on our decisions, which are based on our belief system. Beloved, our belief system needs to be biblical in nature. It needs to be biblical in nature, and we must place all of our actions in that biblical sight. Matthew 7:12 says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law, the Torah, and the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament. Do not seek revenge. In verse 29, the Bible says, To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. These are just things, folks. We're not talking about a life and death situation. We're talking about a situation that, that's perhaps a, a volatile moment for some time. You see, first of all, we need to understand that God is righteous and we must be as righteous as he can be. Men are all born sinners. God is righteous. Choose to live like God. That's our choice today, to live like God. 
To be men and women that say, I don't care what happens. I don't care who says what they say to me or do what they do to me. I'm going to live like God today. We see the Bible says, don't seek revenge. In verse 30, grace is redeeming. The Bible says, give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Oh, folks, you know, I've, I've had people, not as much here as I did when I was in Jacksonville. We were a church that was downtown. We had about six city blocks downtown. And so when we went to lunch, we were inundated with people who were always asking for money. And if I had it on me and the Lord would move me, I would, I would give to them. I've shared with you the time I told the guy that I knew he wasn't going to use the money to get lunch because he had this uh, bottle of beer in his hand on his bicycle when he drove by and asked me, I need some lunch money. I said, oh, yeah, I know where this is going. And I gave it to him and said, I said, look, this is God's money. He told me to give it to you. He looked at me and says, you got to take this back. I said, no, I'm not going to. No, you have to. I was going to spend it on beer. I said, I don't care what you spend. That's between you and God. You have to stand before him for this. I've never seen a guy that, it was like he had a hot coal in his hand. He said, sir, my name's not really so-and-so. I told you a lie from the very beginning. <laughs> this guy was confessing to me. You know, I said, look, I'm sorry, but this is what God asked me to do. You see how you can take a little incident like that and plant a seed in a man's heart and a mind. Had a man years ago, again in Jacksonville, ask me. I was going to the library on a Saturday to look at their sale of books and he came up to me and says, I, I need some money. And I said, well, listen, I have a little I can give you, but I need to share with you. And I end up leading him to the Lord. Now, folks, you see, this is, this is what the whole issue is about. The issue is about, not about money. The issue is not about giving and things. You know, God has given you blessings galore. God has provided for you unbelievably that we can use these same blessings to be a blessing to others. So we don't seek revenge. Grace is redeeming. Bible says in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, the Lord will do a better job. That's why I tell Jesus, I tell people, you know, I don't go to anybody and say, hey, so-and-so did such and such. I go to Jesus right away. So-and-so did such and such. He already knows. But he said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. You know what? I don't worry. I don't miss a wink of sleep over that. We are not called to be vengeful. What if the individual repents of this and comes to the Lord and gets saved? All that is forgiven, beloved. And if you hold something against an individual that's been forgiven by Christ, we've committed a sin right there. We need to remember our sinful past. Keep your ribbon here in Luke and turn a little bit to the right to the book of Titus. It's right before, if you hit Hebrews, you've you're just gone too far. It's 2 Timothy and then Titus. Titus chapter 3, starting with verse 2. To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasure, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We see we need to remember, first of all, folks, that we were once just like them. We were once sinners just like them. And therefore, we have an obligation to remember our past, remember our present, and hopefully help them for their future. So we need to remember our sinful past and then we need to reject our sinful passion of anger, of resentment, of bitterness. These are things that are not of, of God. These are things that in Colossians, the third chapter, Paul tells the church of Colossians, you crucify these things. You crucify these feelings. You crucify these attitudes. 
And so we need to reject our sinful passions. Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be angry and do not sin. and Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. Folks, we need to forgive and let go. You know, the Bible tells us that we are to hate sin, but to love the sinner. That's why my favorite illustration of this is very simple. I hate abortion. I hate everything about it. I think we should do everything we can legally to oppose it. I think we ought to. I think there are a lot of people today that are doing great things or are trying, trying to do great things without being unlawful. But here's what we need to understand, folks. Because I hate abortion, that does not give me the right to bomb an abortion clinic. That does not give me the right to kill an abortionist. That does not give me the right to do something sinful to bless that which God would want. And so, folks, we must be careful. We must hate the sin, but love the sinner. Now, folks, we need to understand because why? Because it's exactly what Jesus did for us. We're all sinners, folks. We all have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has loved us and given us life eternal. Now in verses 32 through 36, we see the practice of his teaching. You see, Jesus' explanation of his teaching is very simple. He's going to give us three examples for illustration back in Luke chapter 6. Those three examples are very simple. In verse 32, the Bible says, But if you love those who love you, what credit is to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Now, how many times you have you seen? Here's a guy at Acts murdered 18 people. They interview his mama. Bobby was such a good boy, you know. Sinners love sinners, folks. What, so what's the difference? We love those who despitefully use us. We see that we're to be mindful who we serve. We see in verse 33, the Bible says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is to you? For even sinners do the same. Folks, we are to do good to all, even those who try to misuse us, even those at work who say ugly things about us. And then the Bible says in verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Jesus said, what's the big deal? If you do it to all the people who love you and care for you, your best friends or whatever, what's the big deal? Even sinners do that. So we are to be mindful of who we serve. You see, you're serving your Savior's pleasure. You're doing what Jesus would have you to do by forgiving, letting go, loving an individual as he would love them. And you are not to serve your sinful passions of anger and resentment. Folks, listen, there are people who are angry people, and I'm including Christians too, that their entire life has been overcome by the anger and resentment there. In fact, it's like a ball of yarn. They've got that anger and they begin to wound that, that, wound that ball of yarn around that yarn around it, around it, about years go by, years go by, and then suddenly they got this big ball of yarn, and they have no idea what's inside, and why they feel angry, and why they're resentful, and why their life is miserable. And you see, that's why the Bible says as soon as that sin comes up, you need to confess it right away. You need to get forgiveness, because if you let that go in your life, you let that fester in your life, your life will be miserable. You're not to serve your sinful passions. And then be mindful. These three things tells us to be mindful of who you strive to follow. Do you model the last lost world or do you model the Lord? And there's the issue, is it not? Who am I to be like? Who am I to be? The Bible says we're to forgive. The Bible didn't say you forgive those who deserve forgiveness. It doesn't say that. The Bible says forgive as in Christ. God forgave you. Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it does seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods which your father served were on the other side, that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You have to purpose in your life to serve Jesus. Now in verse 35 and 36, we see Jesus' exhortation of his teaching. In verse 35, the Bible says that he calls us to be mindful of the hereafter. 
In verse 35, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you'll be the sons of the Most High, and he is kind to the unthankful and evil. We see here, folks, that there is a reward in the world yet to come. Well, you may not get ahead at work. You may not get that advancement you want or that promotion. You may not even get that raise. But you know what? You're banking on another world, are we not? We're not banking on this world. This world is not forever. Folks, what is life? James said life is like a vapor that appears on the window and then it's gone. The psalmist said that life is like a flower that blooms in the morning and, and fades in the afternoon. Folks, this life is so short. You need to invest in the world yet to come. Don't invest in this world. This world is not for us to be forever. Be mindful of who you serve. Be mindful of you, who you strive to follow. Then he calls us to be mindful of the hereafter. Be mindful of God's reward. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. One day, one day, folks, it all comes out. One day you'll receive the reward. One day it all be made right. And then be mindful of God's riches, the riches of his grace. Oh, the Bible says, store your treasures up in heaven where moth or thief and rust cannot destroy. Oh, folks, are, are you placing their treasures in heaven? You see, this world has a lot of treasures. It has things that, that people want. There are people who would sell their mother for a little bit of treasure. But beloved, we must understand that this world is not our final destination. So we need to be mindful of God's riches. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him who has redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You're a child of God for goodness. Live like it. We ought to live like a child of the king. And then we see in verse 36 a call to be merciful. Therefore, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. We're to live in the here and now as merciful agents of God's love and grace. It's a call of reverence to God's command. He says, be merciful. Therefore, because of all of this, therefore, goes back to all these other verses, therefore, be merciful. You see, mercy is what we give to those who don't deserve it. Merciful means you give to somebody who's not asked it. Be merciful. It's a call of reverence to God's command, and it is a call to remember God's compassion, especially as it was freely given to you and to me. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another and tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You see, this whole matter of turning the other cheek, this whole matter of forgiveness, this whole matter of mercy is a matter of our love of God. Romans, the 12th chapter, starting with verse 17. 12th chapter, verse 17. Repay no, ev no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Here's the, here's the point right here. If it is possible, if they will let you, if it is available, if it is possible as much as depends on you, you're the one who has to choose to do this. You don't do it because they they said, oh, be merciful to me. Or they said, hey, you know, you're a nice guy. Why don't you, you know, forgive me? None of that. But it's dependent on you. Live peacefully, peaceably with all men. If possible. If it is possible. If they will allow it. If it is possible. Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. 
For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we see if it is possible, as it depends on you, live peacefully with all men. The Bible teaches us that life is the sacred gift given by God. We have a right and responsibility to protect and defend life. We have a mandate to do all that we can to preserve life. It's sad that we have to have a military. It is tragic we have to have a police force. But folks, listen, if it were not for them, this world would be crazy, would it not? In Esther, the eighth chapter, the Bible talks about a law that was passed. Mordecai, the uncle of Esther, was promoted to a great position there in the kingdom. Haman had gone before the king and proposed a law that all the Jewish people would have all their property taken from them and that they would be killed on a certain day. When it found out that Esther was Jewish, Haman lost his battle and the king had Haman killed on the same scaffold that he had built for Mordecai. And then, of course, the law was there, the law of the Medes and the Persians. You could not change them. You could not reverse them. They were there, and a certain day was going to come. The Jewish people were going to die. And Mordecai proposed a law that would say to the king, let us allow the Jewish people to arm themselves. Let us allow them to protect themselves, to defend themselves. And that law was passed. And so that, that law was passed. You could go to any Jewish home you wanted, take whatever they had, but you had to go past their guard and their ability to defend themselves. Now, folks, let me say this to you. What happened to the people in Persia when this took place? The Bible says in Esther 8, 17, many people of the land became Jews because the fear of the Jews had overcome them. Because they chose to protect life. Because they chose to defend life. God blessed that whole nation. Finally, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, again says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down upon your wrath, nor give place to the devil. When we allow anger and resentment and bitterness to, to maintain our lives, we're allowing the devil to have a hold on our life. But when we defend our lives with the blessing that God has given us to defend, beloved, we speak volumes to the world. Why? Because God is life-oriented. God loves life. He gives us life. He provides life. He gives life. And every relationship and every situation where life does not exist is literally a, a place of, of animosity to God. Oh, beloved, we are to project life. We are to defend life. We are to give our life to defend life. But we're also to love our enemies. This seems to be a paradox. But listen, when Jesus comes back in the 19th chapter of Revelation, we're going to take this world over and he's going to pre present his, his kingdom to this world and it's going to be a new world, a world of, of love, joy, peace, and prosperity. Anyway, folks, so what do we do? What do we do? Do what Jesus would say to do. That person at work that gives you the most trouble, tell Jesus on him. Just tell Jesus, say, hey, this guy's giving me trouble. And pray for that person, that man, that woman, or whomever is doing this. Pray for them. Your whole life will change. Your whole life will change. But folks, we have a responsibility to protect life. We have a responsibility to defend our lives. We have the right laws. We have the right country that says you have the right and the obligation to protect your life. Let's pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. 
I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds